he's here today to share some insights with you and to show you some thought-provoking uh, videos and just to, um, it's Ted. Yeah, it's Ted. Yeah. Thank you. It's an incredibly large group here. Uh, we, I probably, it's really great I have a microphone to project that and the distant reaches. Um, I'm curious, what, what would you guys like to explore? Part of participatory session, so yeah. get in there. What are you curious about? What, what's a good use of the next hour or so? I have yeah. a question. So, so what, what are these schools that are doing the great thing you see? How are they preparing and supporting teachers? So what are the teachers getting yeah. to be able to support this? I'd say that one common denominator every single time they point to a principal or assistant principal that was supportive. You know, it's, it's like they just over and over. I mean, I tell the story in Fort Wayne where, um, I, it's a fascinating story, but it's, I think it's the little things speak for the big things. So there's a guy who was a policeman for 10 years, got interested in teaching, went back, got his teaching credential, substituted taught for a while, finally got his first kindergarten class. He goes to the principal and says, I, I, I looked at what the state tell this is Indiana, a particularly Neanderthal state. He says, I, I looked at what they tell me to do, and they're saying I've got to have kids, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, do 90-minute uninterrupted blocks of reading time. He says, you know, the, the people who write these things every spend time with five-year-olds, you know, they're never going to do that. That makes no sense. And he says to his principal, I think I'd like to have these kids design robots and do 3D printing. And, and the principal says, his name is Jared Nippery, he says, Jared, that's, we've never done that before. That's interesting. How much do you know about it? And he says, I really, I don't know anything about it. And he says, well, do we have any equipment? He says, we, have, well, no, we don't have any equipment at all for that. And he says, I don't know. I mean, like, what, how are you going to do this? And he says, well, I think if I take five and six-year-olds out in Fort Wayne and we ask businesses to put money up to fund the equipment, businesses will have a hard time turning down five and six-year-olds. <laughs> and they'll learn that they can actually make progress by pitching something to adults. So, okay, what, how about learning? He says, you know what, these kindergarten kids will learn. And I'll learn along with them. And I don't mind being in a class where I'm not the expert. And so they do that. And, the, and these kids, I check back with them at the end of the year. They, they excelled on reading a math test. And I said, Jared, how, how do you explain this? He says, well, the math part I really understand. He said, you would, here's how we taught subtraction. Put 10 blocks at the end of a room, program your robot to go get four of them. So when kids are coding a robot, 10 minus 4 equals 6 just didn't seem very hard to them. And these are like blue collar, scrappy, Fort Wayne, hammered community. I said, what about the reading? He said, I don't know. He said, like, it, it could be a lot of things. You know, like they have to learn how to read to you know how to do 3D printing. And they have reason, you know, or whatever. But, but at the end of the day, these kids all couldn't wait to get to school. But I said, like, what's the key? And he said that principle, instead of saying, no equipment and no expertise, absolutely not, do what the state said. And so it's that combination, you know, it's really, that's what makes education so so remarkably hard to change, is there are these interlocking parts. And so, so you have to have parents open-minded, they were, kindergarten is a lot easier than high school, you had to have a supportive principal, he did, you had to have an innovative teacher, he was. And in kindergarten, they're not obsessing about standardized tests, and so we didn't have that trade-off to make. And so. But it was true up and down, is when people, they just had these bold ideas that were so much better for the kids. And you can just look at what they were doing. And I profile a bunch of these in the book, where each one of them, you say, these kids are off and running in life. I mean, a different one is, is I sort of took things from early grades on, but in third, fourth, and fifth grade, a poor community in West Virginia, they get like dump trucks full of technology because of federal grants. And the teachers didn't want to deal with it. And the principal said, why don't we make 50 of our elementary school kids technology ambassadors? Mm -hmm. And she got a group to train them. And so they make all the IT work. But, but it was not just how to get something to, you know, how to smartphone work or this, I can't get my laptop restarted, whatever. They were like, they were evaluating learning apps. And they would make a recommend, you know, you might be the technology ambassador. And I might say, I'm having trouble with math. You took an interview. And you'd say, well, we've looked at these 10. I think you ought to use motion math or something. And you say, like, my gosh, these are third, fourth, and fifth graders. And they're so proud of what they're doing. And they're so confident. And I, I know enough to be able to 
ask them questions to see if they're bullshitting me or they know, mm -hmm. they totally know. Mm -hmm. and, and so you look at that and you say, and that's one of the points I make, is these are eight, nine, ten year olds they could probably, if it weren't for child labor laws, work at the IT help desk for an organization in West Virginia. And that gives you another 10 to 14 years of school to do a whole lot of other things as well. And, but it's the same thing, is that that principal was willing to, and she was a, it was a, you know, tell somebody these little things, tell somebody big things. She was, you know, just a, a regular public school in West Virginia. She had a chance to run. She was dying to do these things. Uh, brought the parent community along. West Virginia, what do they do in their wisdom? Is because of test scores, they weren't particularly well-performing school. So the last time I checked in with her, she had to put up a sign on the front door that Dunbar Intermediate School is a D school because of their test scores for things. And you know, just realize like these moronic bureaucrats or you know, so I look and say, which is one of the core issues. What's the point of school? And, and if you've got these kids at that age already on a great career path, they're excited about it, they like it, it's a career path, you know, it's like, then have you really done a pretty amazing thing? Is that really a D school? Or is that really an exceptional school doing remarkable things for the kids? And so, but I do think that, so that's why having the governor here and having Kimono and having, you know, it's just like, but you know, it's, here, anywhere, you know, you'll meet these teachers doing really great things, but when the principal is the damper on that, and when the parents grouse about it, you know, you can only be bold for so long before you explore that energy and just say, you know, yeah. Um, so I come from outside, I've been a preschool teacher for 25 years, and now I'm an instructor at HCC teaching early childhood. And so it was great to hear all the innovations and ideas. I'm a little frustrated, and I've been frustrated for a few decades, because some of these innovative ideas um, are standard practices in early childhood in terms of meaningful learning, take the children where yeah. they are, individualize. Yeah. I did three home visits for every one of my children. We individual, I mean, I made an hour conference for every kid. Yeah. Um, and the kids, all my kids, they didn't, so the standard here is like whether you get into certain private schools because the public schools have certain reputation and we're trying to flip that. Um, and my, my kids, they were excelling and I keep in touch with them even though they're parents now. Um, and so I'm wondering how, I've been struggling to kind of connect with elementary and middle school and high school to not make it based on grants, but to institutionalize the change in attitude or the values, the relationships. So how, I don't know, how do we, um, going off of the principle, innovative people, how, how can we spread what is in the state, like yeah. globally, because I think there's lots of innovation going on at UH, there's lots of innovation going on in early childhood, and there's lots of innovation going on all in between. So like, how can we, I don't know, how can we not make it a showcase, but then make the spider web? Yeah, so there's so many great points there. I mean, at first I, I underscore what you said, if you look at I'm a big fan of Montessori schools. Mm -hmm. If you observe a Montessori school and you observe one of the startup companies I back, mm -hmm. they look very similar. Mm -hmm. It's like people running around, they're, you know, they're mm -hmm. focused on what they're really interested in. They're, you know, it's just like looks at some level like pure chaos, but it's really actually quite remarkable. And then we just put these kids through a desert of you know, middle, high school, whatever, college applications that we deal with everything. And so, so that, I think, I, I completely agree with you. How I think it's a really interesting challenge for the ages is how do you take points of innovation and have those be more widely embraced? And I think one of the failures, in the, you know, I wish I had my book in front of me, I could just point to it, but is one of the failures is we've had this top down central planning model. We've decided, oh, this looks, you know, or, or, and it's true at the federal level, and it's certainly true at the Bill Gates level, right? Bill Gates wakes up one morning and says, 
You know, I've, I've really been thinking about it. I think every school needs to be small. So I'll just put a billion dollars over the next seven years and make all schools small. Then they'll wake up seven years later and say, I don't think that was such a good idea. So I, I think maybe every school needs to teach the same common core standards and be held accountable to high stakes tests. And let's roll that out quickly without preparing anybody and see what happens there and do that for seven years. You know, so, you know, it's, it's how do you get a bottoms up innovation model to work? And, you know, which is why having the governor and having Kishimoto here is so important is if, if what, what I've observed, and I'm sort of the peanut gallery, so I, I, you know, I don't claim to be um, an education expert, but I've seen a lot, visited a lot. And if, if one teacher in school is trying to innovate, it's a very lonely, difficult life. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. If 10 teachers, it's actually ironically easier for 10 teachers in school to innovate than one. If one school in the community is trying to innovate, it gets branded as that alternative school or that school for those kids. And if every school or most schools are doing it, then suddenly the, the conventional schools look like they're the ones falling behind. Mm -hmm. So there's, and that's where you get this tipping point phenomenon. That's where the change happens slowly right up until it happens quickly. Because if you can get uh, multiple teachers, then everybody else starts. Because there are a lot of teachers you know, and these don't hold me to these exact percentages, mm -hmm. but over and over I see something along these lines. You know, a given school, 15 to 25 percent of the teachers can't wait to be able to run with something different. And then there's this large group in the middle, let's say 50 percent, that if they feel it's safe, if they feel that they're not going to get wailed on, mm -hmm. they're open minded and will try it, and if it works pretty well, they'll do more. Mm -hmm. And then they're another, let's say, 25% that are just absolutely, this is the way I do it, and don't distract me. And, and my advice is always, you can spend forever trying to change the, the ones that are tied to the traditional model, and all that will happen is they're going to get pissed off, and they won't change, and they'll drive down everything. And so just support the innovative teachers, support the Jared Nippers in, in Syracuse Elementary School, because when Jared then did his exhibition night, yeah. Several other classes had kids designing robots and doing 3D printing. And so, so we've got on our website now this thing called an innovation playlist, which is, you know, sort of a, if a school's stuck in the last century, it's got a set of things. Here's what you could do to really get some energy. But it's show them, the, you know, bring the film to your school so people really get inspired about what has to be done, but also totally understand the urgency. Mm -hmm. Then define the profile of your graduate, what you want your kids to be good at through this process of school. And then start taking small steps that lead to big change. And so if you know a school, let's just take a, a middle school somewhere, and let's say everything there is quite traditional. It's just you just know, independent of whether the test scores are great or average or bad, you're preparing these kids to fail. I, it, the model that I think has a real chance of working is that the principal says, at a faculty meeting, this month I'm looking for a few teachers to volunteer to try a Socratic seminar an entirely student-driven class period, one stinking class period out of 20, and then tell us next faculty meeting how it went, but we also would like you to invite a few of the students in to share their perspective. And nobody has to, but who here is willing to? Mm -hmm. and, and a principle that says that somebody giving teachers permission to innovate, and some of those teachers will. And when they do it, and then they come back and say, oh my gosh, and which is, I've been in these things, you know, the teacher will come back and say, it actually was so easy to pull off. Mm -hmm. And my kids, kids that were never saying anything in class, suddenly were really involved. And I got texts and emails from parents that night saying, what happened at school today? My kid was so excited. And, the, and they said it was actually, they learned more and I had less work to do. Well, you know, that's what every other teacher hears. And the principal's saying, we're celebrating this. This is interesting. And they're not saying, you need to do this. But they're saying, we're glad you're doing this. I think that's where you start to get the momentum. And then you just build that into a regular regimen at the school. And, we, and the playlist just says, you know, try a project, you know, do a public exhibition, um, you know, try a student-led parent-teacher conference, try a Socratic seminar, and just ignores this whole bulky mass of curriculum and gets at the fundamental way students engage in the challenges in the learning they do. So, okay. Thank you. Yeah. You know, anything? I've got a couple of things for the group, but I'm happy if this is, we're small enough, we can be dynamic. I, I was just kind of inspired by your, um, your uh, presentation, and I'm just curious about how 
we, we came to the 50th state and we are like the culmination of the delightful celebration fireworks of your 50th state visitation. What do you see that some of us who are in the system are not able to because we work at a school and are, you know, where the rubber meets the road and we don't see some of the innovative things? Yeah. I think it's very, it's very typical of all types of organizations, all types of settings, is that it's really easy to take for granted the great things and to, and, and, you know, I, I'm hesitant to slam the media because they play such an important role in preserving democracy and they're, they're getting well on it. But the stories that take hold tend to be the ones that are negative. And, and when that happens, when you're in that environment, then everybody gets risk averse, and everybody dwells on, you know, Joe Bag and Donuts that did something, and who knows what. And so, you know, I write about um, a different. I mean, Hawaii is in my very last chapter, which is I called it. It takes a village, and it's where communities come together collaboratively in an aspirational goal. And I see that emerging here. But but a different example is in Pittsburgh, and Pittsburgh now is is in year 10, I was there with my film to kick it off, but they had, and they do it each each spring, they have Remake <coughs> Movie Week. And they do these pop-up things, and they have hundreds of pop-up displays all over the city showing kids doing a completely different type of learning. And so you might have kindergarten kids in a public library, or in a community center, or on a street intersection with an adult there to make sure Showing people who come by, and we're making, you know, we printed this, or we're doing 3D, you know, uh, we're doing robotic design or whatever. And they get a lot of media, and they get a lot of corporations to donate time and money. And they consciously go, and they get disproportionately large participation <coughs> in the low-income areas of Pittsburgh, which is really important, right? I mean, just having these things reinforce the advantage that the athlete have is not helping the situation in the way we need to help it. And so what they've done is created this culture in Pittsburgh where everybody says, we want this for our kid. We don't want that. You know, you, and, they, and suddenly when the parents, when the mayor, when everybody says, the, the question goes from not why are we innovating, it goes to why aren't we innovating more? Why aren't we doing things faster? Why are we? And so, each place is different, but if you can create that culture where people kind of get it, where they connect the dots and say, because you know, what happens so many times is a kid will come home from school and they will have worked on something, a project, and the parent will freak out because it's not what they did in school, it's something different. You know, like, my kid seems happy, they can't really be learning, right? You know, it's like, <laughs> or somebody will walk by somebody's classroom and, and everybody's clapping and cheering. I, I, I got to, this is a good time. I want to share this. Okay, I think I can find this. Bear with me, but uh, I'm gonna. This is a great one. Okay, not just good. Let me get rid of this guy. So I'm short. <laughs> Final exam. <laughs> Probably looks like most kids taking a statistics final exam in the US, right? And, and the use it approach, I write about this as well, but there's a guy I'm a big fan of at Harvard called Eric Mazur. So, so bear with me for a second because this is really important. So, Eric teaches, he's the chair of the applied physics department. He actually recently got a joint appointment with the School of Education. Interesting. Uh, he's taught at Harvard for 35 years. He's won Teacher of the Year Award multiple times. And for 15 years, he taught physics the way he learned physics. Mm -hmm. 
and probably the way we all took physics, which is basically a variant of uh, today we're covering electricity. I'm going to turn my back to you. I'm going to write F equals K times Q1, Q2 divided by R squared. We don't need to memorize the fact that that's Coulomb's law. I'll do a few examples on the board with Q1, R, and F. You've got to compute Q2. Maybe we'll modify that around a few times. And then you'll take a final, and I'll give you R, F, and Q2, and you're going to be viewed as an outstanding physics student if you can compute Q1 without a math error or a units error, um, without having the formula right in your pocket. You know, you've got to memorize it. And that's how you taught physics. And um, about 15 years, 20 years into it, he saw this thing that if you're an educator, you can get access to it. So you need an EDU email address. But it's called the Force Concept Inventory. And it was 25, and I'm going to put you guys to the test on one of these. Hold on. Um, 25 really intuitive science questions that two professors at Arizona State University developed to see if their kids, college students, were really understanding science. And so they weren't Coulomb's Law, but they were, can you understand how the world works? So I'll give you, this is a real example. So we're, we're all going to do this. Um, and this is how Eric would conduct this class today, but, but back then he didn't. So real example. Visualize this, it's not paper, but it's a rectangular sheet of copper, uniform thickness. We're going to cut a hole in the center, the size of a quarter, say. We're going to put this in a heating oven and slowly heat it. What happens to the size of the hole? And it, your options are three, right? Bigger, smaller, stays the same. So what I'd like, we're going to do this thing. So what I want is for each of you to think for a couple minutes to yourself. The whole get bigger, smaller, or stay the same. So a couple minutes. And then I'm going to ask you to debate each other, convince each other why the answer is what it is. So okay, give yourself a second. And in Eric's class, you would all have, he developed the software. You'd have something, you'd have your phone. And you'd tell him electronically what your answer was. So he'd be seeing the percentage of kids that said bigger, percentage that say smaller, percentage that say stay the same. OK, so. Everybody got their answer? I'm not asking for it yet. OK. So, um, so now, just, just we'll cheat a little bit. Uh, how many think it gets bigger? How many think it gets smaller? How many think it gets, stays the same? OK. So now just kind of talk to somebody and try to convince them why you're right. I say it stays the same, right, because it's heated. Right. Yeah. We, we don't know how much it's heated. Slowly. 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 Uh, so if any the copper is valuable, right. 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 we're soft, right. but I don't think it will be now. So that was my question. I don't know. Yeah. Like the, 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 one thing I can tell you, it doesn't melt. It doesn't melt. No. Yeah. So, but that hole, you know, there are really only three options in the line for that hole. Bigger, smaller, yeah. and six. And that's moving it to make it bigger. Yeah, so right. there's no movement to, like, 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 that's why, like, those penny machines and everything that, you know, they can eat that. <laughs> but, but I think that's the principle that you have to understand is what is the molecular, molecular makeup of copper that would cause a piece of expanded to turn. And I'm not a scientist person. So, so, so I let's, let's I call, <laughs> yeah, so I like to call my principle, he's a, a scientist. If we were at Eric's class, um, <laughs> He would, with his software, be able to make sure he configured dynamically groups of three and four where everybody disagreed. I've been in that class and I've seen some of the questions where maybe at the beginning, after everybody thought about it, only 10, 15% got it right. And then in the course of debating for 20 minutes, they go to 85, 90% get it right. So that whole process of challenging each other brings clarity to it. So today, so after a little bit of discussion, who believes get smaller. So we got two solid get smaller votes. Who believes stays the same? Got four or five stay the same votes. Gets bigger. You're sticking with your get bigger. So so I'm gonna tell a story I'm gonna tell a story on myself with this, which is I would be on this table. I would have, I agree with these guys that got smaller. And if we were in a debate I would say when you heat metal it expands. It expands uniformly. 
the outer edges go out, the inner edges come in, and get smaller. That's what I thought. I've gone to Eric with this problem to the R&D lab for Google in Boston. All these PhDs in math and science, they were random. They were just guessing. And um, I've been in a great big room with a thousand people. And it's like the room is on fire. The room looks, and these were a thousand teachers, most of whom aren't science teachers. The room looked just like what we saw. Everybody was so interested in this. I've asked this question of maybe 200 groups or individuals. Not once has somebody said, science is boring. Not once has somebody said, I'm not any good at science. They all weigh in and have an opinion. So what's also quite interesting, I think, anyway, is I asked this question of Giannis Ioannidis, who is the head of the Computer Science and uh, Museum, uh, Museum of Science, and now they're going to the computer stuff in Boston. But Giannis was, for 25 years, the chair of the material science department at Tufts. So, you know, that's world-class expert, right? Giannis would be right here at this table with the three of us. Giannis said, get smaller. I said, well, I can relate. I thought he got smaller. If we left here and asked this of an auto mechanic or a, an emergency medical technician or a plumber, almost all of them will get it right. Because what happens if you if you're, have something happen to a finger and your finger's swelling and you've got to get the ring off? You heat the ring, mm -hmm. right? Well, if you heat the ring, you wouldn't heat the ring if the interior is going to get smaller. What happens if you want to get a brake rotor plate off? You take a blowtorch on it and heat it and it expands. What happens if the pipes don't fit? Mm -hmm. Which pipe do you heat up? You heat up the pipe you want to go over it. And so, so we have you know, a, a shining star here, but, but what's interesting to me is that the following, right, is if in fact, because Eric gave these 25 questions to his students, so he heard about it at ASU, they were guessing. He's got these students that had five on calculus BC, five on AP physics, five on AP chemistry, 800 in SATs, all A's into Harvard. He's like, they're going to do really well. These are not, you know, I mean, another example, just so you, you know, that one's a little bit hard. Here's one that you just think is very simple. Airplane flying overhead, open a cargo hatch, drop a heavy object. Its trajectory is A, B, C, okay? I mean, you know, like, these are things you think are like eighth grade science. And Eric gets his results back from this Harvard kids. And at the beginning of the year, they were a net of one half question better than pure guesswork. So, so he said, well, that's shocking. And to his credit, he didn't think the test made no sense. He said, OK, I'm gonna, here's what I'll do. I'm teaching the way I normally do. You can't be too on the fly. Um, but I'll give him the test again at the end of the year. So now, he gives him the test at the end of the year. But it doesn't, it's not a variant to the test. It's the exact same 25 questions. So now I ask you, if you're giving a test like that with these interesting questions to Harvard students in physics, wouldn't they, when they get done with it, you might think some of them might have talked to each other or looked it up or done some research, but it wasn't for a grade, right? It wasn't to jump through the hoops. So he gives it to them at the end of the year, whether they got an A or a B or whatever, they, they had gone, the net increase was they went up another net of one half a question. So they were still ever so slightly better than guessing. And, and so Eric completely retooled his class. And this is where, you know, I think we had it all wrong in education. Is we spent all this time laboriously and tediously laying out the minute by minute curriculum. When you go to Eric's class, I've been in a three hour class he's done, and he said a grand total of five minutes out of three hours. It's just one after another of those types of questions. What happens to the size of the hole? What's the trajectory of the falling object? What, what, what? And the kids in his class now, with that approach, because that's about two thirds of his class, his Socratic seminar around these interesting questions. What's the other third of his class? Basically, CTE or vocational education, hands on projects. Make a circuit work. Here's a good, just good. Jump down the river a bit. If you go Google this, so if you remember and have an interest, if you Google MIT graduation day light bulb wire battery, you will see, uh, it doesn't highlight who the professor is, but it's Woody Flowers, who was the founder of First Robotics. 
And Woody believes that kids learn an enormous amount when they design robots. And Woody also believes kids are learning nothing at MIT. Now, now that's shocking, right? A long-term, tenured, esteemed professor at MIT who thinks that kids are not learning any science and engineering at MIT. But to make his point, on graduation day, he gives all these kids a light bulb wiring battery. Same background, five on AP everything, perfect SAT scores into MIT, graduating in four years, most esteemed engineering institution in the world. Of course, they can make a circuit work, of course. And the kids are like insulted. They're like, I'm in my cap and gown, and you're challenging me with this pedestrian operation. In the video, you'll see kid after kid after kid who can't make the circuit work. And so you start to ask yourself, who's learning science and who's understanding it? And, and are we valuing this thin academic veneer around manipulating equations that actually has nothing to do with the real world? And what Eric found, which I think reinforces the point, is he would from time to time ask his students as a favor to go, because Harvard's, you know, nobody tells anybody what to do at Harvard. So Eric's teaching one way, but you might also be teaching freshman physics, but you're teaching it F equals, you know, K times Q1, Q2, I have my screen saver here, so you know, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, I hope I can wait. Um, and so his kids go and take the final in a formula driven class. They do incredibly well. The formula driven kids come in and take his final, which looks just like, and I'll get to this final in a second, just like what we saw on TV on the, with that video. And those formula driven kids strike out. They can't figure out anything else. And you realize what it's sort of at some level is intuitive, right? Is that if you understand how the world works, the formulas become intuitive and memorable. And if you study and live and read the world of formulas, it's great if you do some down the road, purely math related research. But it, it's not, oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> I mean, it's actually, the slideshow is probably more, I mean, the screensaver is probably better than I am, but anyway, sorry about that. Just um, wanted you to know. I'll take this off and say, well, this is probably, we probably never get this back again. Um, so, so, you know, that's what we know. So, so now it gets better, right? So Eric, for five years, was on the AP Physics Advisory Board, College Board. Billion dollars of revenue a year, gushing money with these standardized tests. And for five years, he lobbies them to include a few questions like, plane flying overhead drops a heavy object, how does it fall? Mm -hmm. And they didn't completely blow him off. They rolled out a trial of it to see. And they come back and they say, All right, it was a really great suggestion, but we, we can't use your questions. And so, why? Why was the College Board not able or not interested in using Eric's questions? Who did, who did, who's that got the answer? Nobody got it right. Pardon? They didn't get any of them right. Okay, that's one theory. Anybody else have a theory? Scoring. Score. How so? Um, that it's a, sh oh, it's a short, short answer versus longer answer. No, the AP, the AP physics is stock full of Coulomb's law type questions. Okay. Oh, that is the essence of the of <laughs> AP physics. Is you know, Q1, Q2, F, what's R? That's AP mm. physics example. Anybody else? So, think of your life in Princeton, New Jersey, if you work for educational testing services. What is the goal of a standardized test? Who, who, what, 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 do you, what do you get up every morning and know you've got to do with your standardized test? Anybody? Measure the masses. Measure, 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 measure the masses, rank them. You've got to rank the masses, but it's but it's more than just ranking them, right? You, you need to produce a bell curve of results. Mm -hmm. If you look at the college board's own papers, mm -hmm. their statisticians say there's nothing about human aptitude or competence that conforms to a standardized curve. It's a nice, convenient form statisticians are comfortable with. So what they find when they use Derek's questions, it compressed the distribution. That, that the kids who were really good at the formulas on balance didn't do as well on how the world works. The kids that do what didn't do as well on the formulas on balance did better on how the world works. The kid that never would get into AP calculus but spends their summers repairing car engines understands how the world works but doesn't do well on the formulas. The kid that can't figure out how to turn on the light bulb, the kid that can't make a circuit work with a battery wire and a light bulb, 
We'll get those Coulomb's law questions, but won't do well on how the world works. And so it compressed the distribution, and that meant they had to rethink everything, and it led to huge amounts of test redesign. And so they said, we're throwing them out. And you, you start to realize why what's happening happens, right? And, and the phrase I use is, we teach kids what's easy to test, not what's important to learn. There's nothing about Coulomb. Anybody can look up Coulomb's law. There's nothing about Coulomb's law that's interesting, absent understanding what it really means in the real world. And so, when people look at the role that, for instance, and I'm, I'm going to Hannah, but you know, that, that an area that we, I think collectively, look down our noses at, which is current technical education, that you know, in most places I go, it's viewed as, well, that's a good path for those kids or for some kids. You know, you didn't cut it, you're somehow inferior, you're not gonna make it, but maybe, maybe, maybe we can rescue you by, you know, giving you a path or a life, you know, life, uh, bring the, to help you be a plumber or something. What, what if it turns out those are actually the kids that really understand? And, and this much I can tell you, fact, because um, I did my, I started my graduate work at Stanford in physics, is there an awful lot of physics and chemistry Nobel Prizes that are won in around the world from the work of the technicians? It's not the PhD that goes up and gets that award. They often say, boy, I'd like to have this. Can you make it actually work? Can you design equipment that makes it work? And I just feel like, what if? And that's one of my points is, what if the heart and soul of school was more making circuits work? Because then, I think you open up career doors for kids, whether they want to be an electrician or a PhD in electrical engineering and not be like Giannis, and to chair the material science department for 25 years at Tufts and not understand how materials respond to heat. Mm -hmm. And it's also useful if you're an adult. And, and who's the loser in that? The, the loser is the college board. The loser is bureaucrats that want the data to rank kids. And, and it's like, that's a very, disturbing trade-off that I think we made in school. So. Oh, one last moment, sorry, on the Eric front. So, I was approached you know, maybe five years ago, six years ago, by these two entrepreneurs in rural India. And they wanted to do, their initial idea was to do an after-school tutoring program for kids in India <coughs> to give them a chance forward. So they're in really bad schools. They have families have no money after-school tutoring. So I say, you guys got to meet Eric. They meet Eric, they're very entrepreneurial, they completely retool high school, chemistry, physics, and math. After school learning, they have two cohorts, teachers and social workers, they have no money. So they either, some of the cohorts had teachers <coughs> in the room, some had social workers. Fast forward, their acceptance rate into Indian Institute of Technology, which is India's version of MIT, was 10 times the national average. And that was from an after-school program at school. And the social worker cohorts outperformed the teacher-led cohorts. Because <coughs> the social workers engaged with kids on the issues that mattered to them. They cared about the kids. They believed in the kids. They helped them with family challenges. And the kids had to figure out the material. They had to solve these problems. And so <coughs> when you look at this, it's like, whoa, there's an enormous amount of leverage, whether it's a science or a liberal arts, in rethinking should we be giving our kids scripted curriculum and textbooks, or should we be giving them thought-provoking questions? And if we give them thought-provoking questions, we'll appeal to the intrinsic motivation of these kids, and we'll see kids show us things that we would never imagine possible. <coughs> Any other good questions? There's a lull. I've got, I can show videos all day long, but Paul, I want to be responsive. Yeah. Not a, question, not a question, Ted, just to support something I know you feel strongly about authentically, and that is shadowing. Um, if you're an administrator, um, the most powerful learning about your school is to shadow a student from the moment they arrive in the morning till the, they get on their bus. <coughs> or it's not, these, this isn't um, observing a class, this is actually. <coughs> walking next to or slightly behind one of your students <clears throat> in all levels of the school. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's the most powerful thing I ever did as an administrator. And I, had my, I was head of school and I had all of my principals and assistant principals 
do it as well. And then we we have the richest conversation ever around transformation and change, more than any conference and any other thing we did. Um, and so that's something that I know that on Ted's website you can learn more about shadowing, but. Can uh, I just add to that? It's great. Um, I, had a, I don't know if you were here, but I'm an early childhood, and I had a student with spinal bifida, and it was the first student I had, and I didn't know she was on a cart, and she needed a catheter, and all of this. And we're a super flexible school, so we went for it. And we never designed the environment for someone on a cart. You know, so what we did was we got my husband's um, mechanical, whatever, you change the oil, that thing from Sears, and then we each rolled on it to see her vantage point, and it was nasty. I mean, it's dusty, ugly, unappealing, and everything was up here where she would have to strain her body. And again, it was the most um, inspiring thing and it, it changed our practice so now each teacher whatever age group they're in from infants to toddlers to five-year-olds do something similar to make sure the environment is um, appealing nurturing and stimulating yeah. for them so that's wonderful so and i'll just put a plug in for this so you know the film's been seen you know screened by communities four thousand times the question I always got is, what do we do next? And so we've sort of integrated a bunch of things I'm involved with into something we're calling the Innovation Playlist. But if you were, let's say we were, the three of us were involved, in all of the small hole table, we were all involved in the same school that was sort of a 1960 vintage school that just, we knew it's not getting people, you know, preparing kids the right way. Then what we suggest is, you know, start by bringing the film to your school and having a community screen so you develop a general support and energy among the school community for the idea of changing. And then work with that community, ideally after the film is screened, just have a working session for what do we want our kids to get good at? Because if everybody's all in a room and they've just seen the film, it's the perfect time to build a community consensus, because they'll all say creative problem solvers or collaborators or communicators, or whatever. And so then when you start doing changes, you were able to say, when somebody says, well, why are you doing that? You're saying, because we all agree our kids need to be creative problem solvers. And so when they're doing this, it's really reinforcing and helping them develop that. So that's why we're doing it. And we're doing what we, as a community, said is important. And then, consistent with what Robert said, and this is a, an initiative I've involved with School Retool at Stanford, and they do this Shadow of Student program, and they've got all the resources for that. And the last few years, some 2,000 principals in the country shadow a student. But the thing we sort of add to this is the following, is we really encourage you to do that after you define the profile of your graduate. Because it's one thing to just go through the day with a student and say, God, it's so boring, and I, I can feel their pain, and this didn't make sense. It's really different if you've said, our goal with our kids is to help them become really good at whatever, collaboration. Now as I go through the day with them, <clears throat> I'm going to keep track of where are they getting positive support and reinforcement for collaboration skills and where is it irrelevant? <coughs> or, I'm sorry, <coughs> be one day. Um, and where is, are things happening that actually are anti-collaboration? Where is there cutthroat competition in a class that actually pulls against collaboration? And so if you do that, but I want to add one other thing about Shadow of Student is because um, the School Retool program really focuses on principles, but it's enormously powerful. And I think Robert would echo this, if you draw a broader set of people and they're all shadowing a different student and then sharing their collective re uh, reflections. And I write about this program, uh, it was just blew me away, it's in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And they called their project, so I want you to visualize this. Some educators, they think school is just screwing kids going forward, they're passionate about it. How do you get a community to be really motivated to do it? They organized what they called the Billy Madison Project. I'm not an Adam Sandler movie freak. <clears throat> Billy Madison apparently is a movie when Adam Sandler goes back to school as an adult. They asked the teachers, would you be willing to come in on a Saturday and just conduct a normal school day on a Saturday, but not for your students? They got 65 people in their community, everybody that's involved in decisions about schools, so mayor, business people, school board, parents, 
other teachers. They got 65 people to come in and go from 7.45 in the morning till 3.30 in the afternoon through the exact school day that the students had gone through on Friday. And then they got to the end and they asked them, and so the mayor has to hold up his hand and get permission to go to the bathroom. You know, and the guy that's a, one of the guys that went was a, a, a money manager. So he's a quant jock who makes, trades lots of money with, you know, math algorithms. So they're all there. Then at the end, they bring him in and they say, so do you think we should keep doing what we're doing and just try to make it a little better? Or should we be really radically rethinking what we do with our kids? 65 people all say, change everything. The math and quant job money managers, I sat in a math class. No one ever uses anything you're having these kids study. They all looked at this and said, you can't just be nudging it forward. You need to completely rethink it. Then they created this program called Iowa Big. And it's, I, you, I, I often describe it as the best school no one can visit. And you can't visit it because there is no school. And so it's in Cedar Rapids. There are three mainstream comprehensive high schools. They draw kids from all three. They spend most of their mornings at their high school. They play sports on their high school team. But they have all afternoon and all their free time around projects. They have one adult liaison who goes out into the Cedar Rapids community and approaches businesses and nonprofits and policymakers and said, what are projects you have where students can make a difference? It turns out there are a lot. You know, and for starters, every organization needs help on social media strategy, and these high school kids really understand that. And so these kids, that's the part and soul of their school experience. And they've gone from 15 kids to a huge number with a waiting list. Uh, the schools that used to think of themselves as rivals now cooperate. Uh, teachers are being asked to be on advisory boards for some of these organizations because they're helping solve problems. Teachers learn about the real world, the real world learns about the students. 97% got into the first choice colleges, they're doing great summer jobs, and they're, many of them don't have to go to college to have a great career. And, and you just say, could you do that absent a groundswell of community support? Probably not. But 65 people, in one day, I mean it's like that's, could anybody do that? Sure. You know, I mean, you guys do amazing things here. Could you pick a community, get 65 movers and shakers to go through the school day, and say, what do you think? More of the same? A little bit better? Or really, should we be thinking really big about this? And so, you know, I think a lot of times these things just take a little bit of, like, audacity or daring or thinking outside of the box. And I see tons of that here. But, you know, when you can get everybody mobilized and energized, and, you know, that's, you know, they say, the other thing they say is that kids used to say, I can't wait to get out of Cedar Rapids. They, they called Cedar Rapids, the, the, the name that the high school kids often refer to their town, they, they called it Cedar Crappens. And, and now they're all saying, I, I'm not going anywhere. This is where my network is. This, I've already got a running start. And, you know, when I traveled, it was so interesting because I met with um, uh, Ryan, Ryan Wise, who's their superintendent of public, their version of Kichimoto. And we had a great meeting in the afternoon, but, but one of their big goals, he takes, he, he's drinking the Georgetown Steady Kool-Aid, which is, you know, going forward, 70% of adults need an advanced degree to plug in and get jobs. You know, and you'll read that, people think that. And so that, they have future ready Iowa. 70% of adults need a college degree to have any chance of a job. And Ryan came to a community screening, but this kid, Isaac, who's a freshman at Iowa, big kid, and so I said, Ryan, I just want you to meet Isaac and hear a little bit about what Isaac has learned as a freshman at you know, high school. And Isaac goes through like all these coding languages and the interview he did on child trauma programs and how he's now got a summer job where he's teaching kids how to use technology. And you know, like, like the kid's making 30 bucks an hour running these summer programs. And, and I said to Ryan, you know, like Isaac may go to college. But he doesn't have to go to college, and if he goes, he'll pay for it with his, his part-time job. And you know, it's like, we just keep thinking. It's like over and over again, the mantra is, at every point in time, prepare kids for the next hoop. You know, and it ripples all the way back. And you were talking about early, you know, preschool can prepare kids for kindergarten. You know, early, I mean, in the book I wrote with Tony, we had this letter from Elmwood uh, Elementary School in New York State, where they write a letter to the parents, and they say, we regret to tell you we're canceling our tradition of having the annual school play for our kindergarten kids. 
we found is taking too much time from college and career readiness. And, and you say, have people lost their mind? And, and I think the answer is they have. And so you know, you keep preparing them, middle school to prepare for high school, high school to prepare them for the college application. Then, you know, lousy intro high college courses, you need to do lousy high school courses for lousy college intro courses, and on and on. And, and our mantra is more and more expensive formal instruction for our kids in a world where it's easier and easier each month to learn on your own with the online resources. And, and at a certain point, when you, and this is one of the things I really feel so strong about, is that if to get to life's starting point, you need to spend 75000 to 300000 for a college degree, and colleges aren't starting to rank. So I, I got a ride here this morning. So I, I came over with Uber, and I sort of got in the car, and I said, I usually love to talk to people, but I this talk I'm giving, I'm sort of running through my thoughts and everything else. And I said, so I'm probably going to be a little bit rude and just focus. But, but I, I couldn't. I said, so like, how long have you been in Hawaii? How long have you been driving for Uber? What's your background? He's served in the Navy for 20 years. He's nearing you know, his 20-year mark, so he's going to be leaving, filling in the gaps with Uber driving, even though he's a long-term naval officer. And he's got to go. He feels he's got to go to college. And, and, he, and he looks at this, and he says, I look at the distribution requirements. Or there's nothing I'm interested in. I already, he does all this technology stuff in the Navy. And, and yet he's there because oftentimes the adult workforce uses college as a convenient screening mechanism. We're basically stacking this 75 to 300K obstacle in front of all kids. And if you're uber affluent, it's a yawn. But for most families, it can be debilitating. Mm -hmm. And so if that's the world we live in, so I say, like, how innovative will colleges be? I don't really believe they'll be very innovative. So where's the opportunity? I think the opportunity is to make the K through 12 experience meaningful. Launch kids, you know, like I was talking about, Fort Wayne, you know, rural West Virginia. I mean, these kids can develop great hireable proficiencies during those years. Make college optional. I'd love to see that as a mantra. Instead of college ready for everybody, be college optional for everybody. Which we can do. I mean, we can absolutely do it. So, yeah. I think everybody that's attended the conference, certainly in this room, and the folks who talked to you yesterday, subscribe, at least personally subscribe almost 100% to what, what I hear. I mean, and the message is, is uh, absolutely refreshing. But as you crisscross the country and hit all 50 states, and you saw pockets of innovation, and you saw pockets perhaps not, you know, stagnation or, or whatnot, can you take the leap or can you take some of that and crosswalk it to whether or not facilities matter? In other words, oh, the yeah. environment that these kids that we want to, that all of these great ideas and this, whatever we're defining as a 21st century school, and that varies across <coughs> the nation. I mean, some believe it's brick and mortar, some believe what's happening inside is brick and mortar. But because you have this, this beautiful litmus of all 50 states and being able to have been in many, many classrooms, does it have relevance? Does it connect? Does it have an absolute umbilical connection to the learning that's happening? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny. It's interesting in that in my journeys, I don't know if you have an architecture background, but architects have this remarkable intuitive sense about what makes sense for education. And I think part of it is that you're judged as an architect by your poor AP course or something like that. But, you know, like you look at the film at High Tech High and the space is beautiful and everybody says that must have cost a fortune and everything else, but they got that space given to them by a naval, it was an abandoned naval facility. And it turns out if you don't put up lots of walls, it's actually less expensive to outfit the space. I mean, it's interesting, I do a lot of as well in North Dakota. And so I was with the governor and his chief of staff uh, two months ago. And they said, we don't think we're ever going to build another high school. Because all these big box retailers are going out of business. And so we can get this cheap, large, kind of almost like warehouse space. And if we just use that to sort of have dynamic, flexible learning spaces, you know, honestly, if you've got the ability to move stuff around, lots of light so that people feel that sense of, you know, like openness and good Wi Fi, you know, like you're in good shape. Or Iowa Big, right, which is one of the best education initiatives in the country with no building. And it's really scary to people to think of kids not ever going. You know, like what, like you know, always read these things about like uh, Washington D.C. schools. Kids are getting hammered, and schools are getting hammered because they're graduating kids with low 
attendance records. And I said, well, you know, like, depends on what they're doing outside of school, right? I mean, our issue isn't whether they're in the classroom in the seat or not. The issue is whether we make use of it. And so I think in a really interesting way, um, I, I was involved with an arts group years ago, and somebody once made that observation about an arts group where they said, the performing space will define your organization and its strategy. And, and I thought, is that backwards? Wouldn't the organization and its strategy then say what the space has to be like? But I think that we influence where you say this is how it's, this is how people are going to configure and work together. And you look at the modern office, right? I mean, with these companies, those spaces don't look even remotely like that. You know, you go into a WeWork or you go into the companies I still am involved with, and it's all just, people don't even have offices anymore. You know, they just, they, it's all on your laptop, they're moving around all the time, they're dramatically, and I, I talked about, maybe one last anecdote, but I read about the school I was at in Austin, Texas, which, uh, Acton Academy, I was blown away. So it's no grades, no, no nothing, there's nothing about it, but as soon as you're there, they are radically transferring responsible, responsibility for the learning to the students. And it is 100% the student's responsibility. And so 180 kids, three adults total. That's it at that school. Three adults, 180 kids. You think it's crazy. You think it can't possibly. And these are just normal running of kids you know, from Austin. I watched for two hours. They wouldn't let me inside the room. Two hours, kids, they don't have grades, but grade, ages like 8, 9, and 10. For two hours, we're in a room working incredibly hard without a single adult in the room. But again, open space, beautiful open area. And, and at the end, they let me talk to the kids. And I said, you know, like, what are we doing? And every single one of them said something like, well, I'm really interested in this, so I was really looking into and doing research into this. Or my little team is creating this, so we were working together. And these kids would go from being on a laptop alone or reading a book to working in a group or being whiteboarding on a smartboard. They said about, 15% of the kids who try it, it doesn't work. And they just sort of head back to where they were before. And nobody does it work day one. But you know, a month or two in where you say, we really mean it, you're responsible, you're running your conferences, you're setting your objectives, you own everything, this is up to you, not these adults. And, and you look at this thing and you say, my gosh, these kids are so, and, and at the end of the day, there are no bells, but, but when it was time for school to be done, these kids immediately went and did the into day chores. So you get kids go off and clean the bathroom, kids sweeping the floor, kids doing all this stuff, and then they go home. And you know, you just look at this and you say, what if, right, what if we actually delivered on making it the kids' responsibility going forward instead of channeling them down a narrow path according to what adults think? And if, you know, I think your space observation is really interesting if you had a space that sort of promoted that instead of you know, putting it through a rat's maze. So awesome. So I think, yeah, hi. I, nice to see you. Um, but I think, I think something that you said resonates really with me with that. So when I think of like when I started working, I was out on the Bayani Falls working in condemned buildings. And I think about the high school that was built for when, at Kaiser High School when my, when my daughter went to high school, which to me looked like a utilitarian building that wasn't, wasn't architecturally inspiring. So I, but I do think that the physical, I do think the physical facilities set part of the climate for the school. Also set the, the tone for the people who work in the school. So I think for people who are providers, so if you were like the OT like me and you were assigned to some dilapidated room closet that the custodian used to use to store a half of your working space was with you know mops and brooms and car, you know, things like that. It has an impact on the on the staff, I think. And so I, I think it's not just the physical space, but it is the it is how much are we putting into maintenance and renovations. So I yeah, think but I, there's, I, I, I think mean, there I see is some, some that, unbelievably run down. Yeah, places there, it is. there are, and you know, so you could I guess you could design beautiful spaces that look at Hawaiian architecture that use our natural light and our and our airflow. Maybe at the same person or what cost of some things that are very utilitarian and look like something out of a product. You know, I mean, so if you think about how we're trying to redesign um, state housing to make it look better, maybe we could put some of that energy into our I, 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 yeah. building new schools. I mean, your point's a really good one, and if it's really a horrible facility, it just drags everybody down. That said, 
So you look at a big island, West Hawaii Explorations right. Academy. I mean, it's the outdoor tents, right? Mm -hmm. And then I was talking to somebody on Oahu who started a charter school, and he said he's having trouble raising money and getting a facility. He said, why don't you use tents? Well, there's some regulation that says you can't do that. But the other thing about these buildings, right, is that what High Tech High does is the reason it looks so beautiful is it's student work that's yeah. presented. Yeah. Yeah. And what I find, what, what, you know, we, in venture capital, we, this I think is interesting, is that we would from time to time have startups that would come to us. There was this one building in Boston that was super plush. And startups from time to time would say, somebody renting space here just went out of business. We can get an 18 month short term lease, and it's less than space anywhere else in Boston. We want to do it. And we would every single time say no. Because we felt if our startups were in too nice a space, it sent a message in the title. Mm -hmm. and when I go to these colleges, and I go to them, mm -hmm. and when their bathrooms are nicer than the Four Seasons bathroom, mm -hmm. and when they're raising 50 to $100 million for a workout center or everything else, and they're not doing teacher development, and they're not paying their teachers right, then I say, you know, and, and like, for quality of space is like how much money you have, right? Below a certain level, life is hell. But, but once you reach a threshold, more isn't better. And I think a lot of places think if you just, you know, I see it in North Dakota, they'll raise a town with hardly anybody in it and we'll do a bond issue for $50 million for a new high school. And I'll say, you know, like, you can accomplish a lot at $50 million, but you, know, you really need to get better learning experiences. So, awesome. Thank you so much.